bachelor's degree from, uh, in chemical engineering from Manhattan College in New York City. Her career at Kennedy Space Flight Center began by approaching the Society of Women Engineers booth at an engineering career fair and applying for some student uh, opportunities at NASA, eventually uh, pursuing a research path. Over the past five years, the majority of her research projects have focused on technology development here towards human spaceflight. When the opportunity uh, for a Mars analog for high seas, high seas stands for Hawaii Space Exploration Analog Simulation, came about, when that opportunity came about, she thought that her current research project at KSC would be a good fit for an analog study to boost the understanding of the technology on a long duration deep space mission. Uh, she spent four months living in isolation on the slopes of uh, Manoa Ayo, Aya Volcano in Hawaii. It's a long time. <laughs> uh, where the landscape looks surprisingly similar to the landscape on Mars. Anne's going to uh, tell us about her amazing experiences and the possibility of a crewed mission to Mars. So please join me in uh, welcoming Anne. Okay, well, those were my first two, three slides, so thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My do. name is Annie. I'm a chemi at Kennedy Space Center, and I'm here to talk to you about high seas. It's not about going surfing in Hawaii. It has nothing to do with the ocean. Uh, it stands for Hawaii Space Exploration and Analog Simulation. In 2012, a public call came out asking for candidates to go live in isolation on the slopes of Mauna Loa with an international crew, and I applied, and I didn't get it. I, I made it to the highly qualified candidate list, and that was it. Then one year later, another call came out, and I applied again, and this time I made it. So I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the mission and what it was like and what's in store for NASA. Um, going to Mars and the future of the high seas program. So this is where I lived for four months. This is part of a NASA study in conjunction with the University of Hawaii. Um, this primary research focus was on psychology of a crew living in isolation similar to that of Mars. This is going to be a four month, eight month, and 12 month mission. So when I applied, all the applicants didn't know if they were going to be on the four month, eight-month or 12-month mission. The eight-month mission starts October 15th, which is in about five days. So I'm um, on the weekends on the mission support team for that, and I'm really excited for the crew. And Godspeed to them for the toilet, which I will explain later. Um, the reason why this is a, a NASA focus in psychology is because there's a gap in understanding of a crew. Right now, we have astronauts living and working on the International Space Station, which is 220 miles above Earth's atmosphere. We can talk to the crew real time. We can figure out problems for them without them having to worry too much. They perform a lot of research that's going to help us get to the next step um, in traveling beyond low Earth orbit. So when a crew is living on Mars, there's going to be a communication delay. Of, right now, it's at 40 minutes. And that depends on uh, you know, what orbit Mars is in at the time. And that will create a different, a different flow for what NASA is currently used to, since we can't talk to astronauts 24-7 you know, constantly, whenever we want. So this is meant to help uh, psychologists develop technology for astronauts on how the crew will become autonomous, um, different research techniques that will help, help mission support know when a, uh, when a crew is under distress or if something's not going right. Because if you have ever met a real astronaut and you've talked to them about a mission, if, if you go and then talk to their mission support, if something was wrong, an astronaut is very hard-headed. They'll say, nothing's wrong, we're going to get it to work right, it's going to be OK. Um, however, on the screen in mission control, you know, you can see that stuff is wrong, even though the astronaut's really trying. So astronauts are very good like that, and that they, they're just very motivated and very driven, and they want to get the work done. However, what about when you can't have instant communication and you can't see their systems real time? I mean, that's going to be something that becomes an issue. So a mission like this to help understand how a crew has cohesion, how they, the leadership evolves over time, that's going to help NASA develop tools 
for future missions and the challenges that will come with going to Mars. So we have a long way to go before sending humans to the red planet. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done all around the world in order to develop the technology we need to send humans there. I like looking at the depictions that NASA has for one day when humans might land on the planet. And the technology that is being developed for this feat is necessary not only for survival as our species in the long term, but it will also help sustain our fragile planet. There's a lot of really great spin-offs that come from NASA research that many of you may not even realize. And if you don't realize, I, hope, I encourage you to go look at the NASA spin-off website so you can see just how, how beneficial a lot of the technology can be that comes from the space program. So this is NASA's take on how we would potentially get to Mars. It's a three-step process. Right now we have Earth-reliant missions which use the International Space Station and it only takes us a matter of hours to get back home to Earth. It's here on the International Space Station that we will develop technologies that we need in order to go beyond low Earth orbit. There's a lot of challenges. There's challenges with propulsion systems, there's challenges with radiation, there's challenges with understanding how humans can remain healthy and not have bone loss or changes in their eyes. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're studying and learning on the space station that will help us go to the next step, which will be the proving ground. It's here we'll, where NASA has the asteroid redirect mission and we'll go to a retrograde orbit and we'll prove how our systems work and how we can sustain ourselves and not have quick time pop up. <laughs> and um, again, it'll take days to come back from a mission like this, but it'll really get us out of low Earth orbit and really prove that humans can survive without having to be just a few hours from Earth. After this is done, we should be ready to have the systems to go to Mars and send humans. A mission like this will be two to three years long it'll take months to return back to Earth. So we really have to be independent um, from Earth. And then once a human comes back to Earth, you know, the thought is when they come back to Earth, they'll be home. It doesn't matter what country you're from, where you grew up, as soon as you hit Earth, you're home. And so I really enjoy the space program because it brings a lot of countries that are maybe in political strife together, and it, it makes us see our Earth as you know, one humanity. On December 4th, at KSC, out in Cape Canaveral, they're going to do their EFT-1 launch with Orion. This was a Lockheed Martin-developed uh, human-rated vehicle where they're going to do their test on a Delta IV rocket. And this is the capsule that will hopefully boost humans beyond low Earth orbit. So if you have the opportunity to go out to KSC December 4th, I highly encourage you. Um, and so they're going to go and launch it and test a lot of the systems. And then in the future, around 20, 17 or 18, don't quote me on that, uh, we, we might be able to uh, launch humans on it. So, back to the mission I was on. We called our, ourselves simulated Martians because we weren't actually on Mars, but we were pretending that we weren't on Mars, so we just called ourselves simulated Martians, or for sh short, Martians. Um, this is a book that I read while I was there. If you haven't read it, it's a very good book. It's fiction, however, the author goes into great research and um, detail about what a human and, and their closed loop systems would potentially look like on Mars. So I really, you know, if you really like space stuff, read that book. So what does it take to be a simulated Martian and join the six person crew that I was on? I had to pass a, a class two flight medical. You had to have certain academic requirements. You had to write a research proposal because each individual crew member would be doing research aside from the overarching psychology study that was going on. You had to write an essay, you had to have um, reference letters, you had to have interviews with the principal investigators of the mission. Then you had to take a lot of psychological assessments and some weird math tests. Um, and you also had crew interviews. And this was because it was a tiered down select process where we were down selected to a smaller crew and then the crew members actually introduced each other to one another, and then we down-selected even further. Because you can often tell in just a few moments if you want to live in isolation with a person. So uh, that made it um, a little bit easier. This was the crew that was selected, and um, that's our, one of our suits that we would go outside in. And I'm going to just spend a little bit of time introducing each crew member, since I did live with them for 120 days in isolation. Um, these were, so it was three males and three females. 
These were the three females. We had Lucy, and her title was chief, uh, crew scientist. She was from France, but she works for the DLR, uh, which is the German Aerospace Company in Germany. And her primary research project, project was looking at the effect of LED wavelengths on plants. Uh, we call her space chicken, because in, in French, poulet means chicken. And um, she's, she's trying to grow vegetables, which is sort of ironic, um, because that's the opposite of chicken. Um, then there's me from New York. And we were studying a technology that we were developing at KSC called trash to gas. This was a steam reforming reactor that would convert waste into useful commodities for deep space. And our ultimate goal is methane, because there's a lot of LOX methane, uh, liquid oxygen, liquid methane uh, for propulsion systems for deep space. Um, so we, because I was selected for the four-month mission, which was in a couple months from when I found out, we weren't ready to bring the reactor into the habitat because it was in a hood and it wasn't ready. And um, just a side story, when I actually was selected for the four-month mission, I asked the crew, the, the principal investigators, I said, why did you pick me for the four-month rather than the eight or the 12-month? You know, do you think I'm crazy? Do you think I can't handle it? And they said, no, what we did was we selected all the crew members up front and then we grouped them into large pools together. And we said, okay, we think all these people will get along, these people and these people. Um, and then we notified the four month crew first. And so now the eight month crew is starting and life happens and life changes. And so some of the 12 month crew members can't make it anymore. So they're actually doing another internal call. And I said, oh, could I, could I go on it again? And um, they said, nope, because it's a psychology study, you have to uh, you know, remain uh, a fresh crew every time. But anyway, it, maybe in the future we'll have a reactor to send there to, to get even more high fidelity testing, I'm not sure. Um, and then there's Tiffany, she was our medical officer. Uh, she is a student at the University of North Dakota. She works on developing um, analog and space uh, suits. So she was looking at EVA suit performance metrics from the suits that we had on our mission. These were the three males on the crew. We had Casey Stedman. He was our commander. He's from Washington. He's a navigator in the United States Air Force. And as commander, he did not have a research project. Then there's Ross Lockwood. He was our chief technologist. And he brought a whole bunch of 3D printed medical tools where we did all sorts of testing. So I now can confidently say I can suture a wound. So if you're ever in the need, just let me know. And I'll <laughs> grab my 3D printed tools. Um, he's a PhD candidate from Canada. And then there's Ron Williams. He was um, considered our crew psychologist. He's from Indiana. And he was doing a separate psychology study aside from what High Seas uh, NASA psychology study was doing. I will say that after 27 days, Ron did leave us due to medical issues. So he, we went down to a five person crew. And NASA and mission support treated this as a loss of crew member. So we remained five people throughout the mission. This is where I was living. Again, not surfing on the beaches. Um, I was right about here. This is on the big island of Hawaii um, in the Saddle region, and across from us is Mauna Kea. This is a aerial view. I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer. Um, our habitat was right up there. I'm too short to reach it. But this is along a fissure line, which means there was an eruption here a long time ago, but it was not an explosive eruption. So lava was flowing out of it, but not you know, going all over the place like you would think of a classical volcano. Um, there was a lot of pohoihoi lava and a'a lava surrounding us, and this creates a lot of uneven terrain. Uh, the ground can break under you when you walk on it, and there's a lot of lava tubes under the ground. And the reason why they picked this region, which they did a lot of research on where um, where on the earth we should put this habitat is because Mars is made up of a lot of volcanoes and there's a lot of former eruptions in Mars and the terrain and the geology features of this area was very similar to that of Mars. So the, the specific area where we were was an abandoned uh, rock quarry. So there was a lot of um, dug up cinder cone around our, our region. So just to give a quick recap, in case you're getting lost, these were the two grants that NASA funded us with, this mumble of letters and numbers. Um, the primary objective was a psychology investigation, and NASA wanted to study a few different things, and this is how they did it. They studied group cohesion, 
biopsychosocial behavior, which as an engineer I never really heard of that word before. They had studies for leadership evolution. They studied our physical activity. We all wore these armbands around our left arm, um, and we had, no, it was our right arm. I forget which arm. Um, but anyway, they studied things like our sleep behavior, um, our skin temperature, how many steps we had, how active we were, um, different things like that to monitor our physical activity. They also monitor crew performance by assigning us different uh, roles. We had uh, different EVAs that we were assigned. EVA means extravehicular activity, and that's when you would go outside um, in your fake spacesuit and perform whatever mission they assigned. And so they had different measures of success uh, to measure crew performance. Then we had these little cognition tests that we had to take on an iPad. And this is actually something that they do on ISS right now. And they're trying to replace the tool on ISS with the tool that they had on our mission. And it's basically a series of strange uh, you know, shapes and color and um, different, different cognition tests that you can see how, how an astronaut is performing throughout a long duration mission in isolation. And so we, we did that every few weeks. Then we also had to write daily journals for computer interpretation. Basically, they're trying to develop a tool where an astronaut could be very open and write about the activities that are going on throughout the day. And um, if you're having problems with someone or you're, you're really upset with someone, maybe the computer can interpret exactly the mood and how you're feeling. They don't want people to just sit and read journals all day because that's an invasion of privacy. But if you could have a tool um, for a long duration uh, Mars mission, it would be something that you, know, you could definitely use to help coach your astronauts if things are going wrong and they're not really telling you what's wrong. Uh, we had to take a lot of daily surveys, a lot of how are you feeling, how do you feel about this person, what did you eat today, how did, the, how did eating make you feel today, did you work out today. So a lot of things if you're an engineer you're not really used to expressing or um, it, it was a lot of touchy-feely things but um, it was to help in this entire psychology investigation. We also had to wear these sociometric badges around our neck 24-7. We could take them off when we weren't sleeping. And um, basically, it, it shows how close you are to someone, how loud you're speaking to them, how often you're speaking with them. And so all of this data just built a big picture for the psychologists so that they can create these tools for deep space. Then we were also videoed, um, only in social areas. So we didn't have video cameras in our room. This was not reality TV. This was just to show, you know, if someone's writing in their journal that they were working for four hours w with someone and it was terrible and they weren't, you know, communicating right. Well, they can go watch the video and say, um, you guys were talking for five minutes. On, you know, your journal's not really adding up. So again, it's just this big, um, this big overall picture. And then it was also who's doing what chores, who's doing what tasks. Is this person cooking a lot longer than another person? So I don't understand all of it, but. This is, this is what they were looking for. Um, I was there for four months, and we had a 40 minute communication delay. This meant there was no streaming, no phones, no Skype, no live chats with anyone. So if you're not used to that, if you're not used to just unplugging from your life, it can be, it can be very difficult for some people. So, okay, this was the habitat. It was about 1,000 square feet, and we were powered by solar power. Um, it was two levels. This was uh, hydrogen fuel cells that they're actually going to use on this eight-month mission. Our backup power was a gasoline power generator, and then these two tanks on the right, they were 500-gallon water tanks that were pumped into a water pump that was in the shipping container, and all of this is connected. And the shipping container, um, the water pump would flow water into our kitchen and bathroom, and then our wastewater would come out and go into those two tanks, so it was not a closed-loop system. Um, and then we had small solar panels, which gave us some warm water for when we showered. Um, and then we had a vent, a round vent on the top left. That was our one vent to get all of the air out. And then we had two air intakes on the bottom. Um, that other vent on the right that you see, that was a vent that was taking the uh, waste from our, our toilets and uh, evaporating it and releasing it. So it felt pretty bad if you stood, in, if you stood right about there. <laughs> Again, this is a close-up of our, our solar arrays. Uh, just to take a step back and give you some size perspective, that's Mount Akea across from us. It's about 13,700 feet. Uh, Mount Loa is about 13,600 feet. I'm off by a couple 
feet, but they're only about 100 meters difference. We're not at the top, we're on the slopes of Mauna Loa, so that's why Mauna Kea looks so much taller. But that's where they have all the telescopes that look into deep space. Um, and then these three little yellow things, those are my three crew members. And we actually went out for a sunrise EVA towards the end of the mission, because as you can see, we have, no, we have one window, and you, you can't see it from here. And we didn't get to see a sunset at all, or a sun, excuse me, a sunrise at all. So as the mission was beginning to wind down, we said, we want to go outside and see the sunrise. So that's where, why this picture is the way it is. And I kind of ran away to take a faraway picture of them. This was the crew on the first night that we got in there. We look extremely happy. Some of us still have color and some suntan on our faces. But you can actually see it was very wet and rainy. And the habitat actually had puddles of water all over it. And because it stayed wet and rainy for a few days, it was very hard for us to generate power from our solar panels. So we had to live with the sun. You know, when the sun rose, we had to wake up, do our power things, and then go to bed. We had to preserve power so that in case we didn't have power the next day, we could save some charge. So we all look happy, but little do we know, the next couple of days are going to be pretty rough because we're in isolation, have very little communication and we can't get power very well. So that was a fun time. This was my room that greeted me uh, when we got in there. Uh, it was very comfortable. It was a little bit smaller than my freshman college dorm. So um, it had a bed, a desk, a shelf, and then this little chair actually was also a storage bin. Um, but once we put all of our stuff in it, they told us to bring lots of pictures, make it feel like home. However, I don't know if you can tell, but the ceiling is actually slanted in this picture. So when you're in bed, if you sit up, you're going to smash your head on the wall. So, so the picture's a little deceiving. Uh, this is the three of us uh, with all of our stuff in it. So we definitely made it feel like home. Uh, this is our kitchen. Uh, as you can see, it's, it, it really looks like a, a comfortable kitchen. We have a mini fridge over there, which we, we would store our hydrated milk um, and some leftovers. Then we had a kitchen sink where we could wash our dishes. I call it Girl Scout camping style because we had um, a soapy bucket and then a bleach bucket and then you would rinse it because water was very, uh, we had to be very conservative with our water. And then to cook meals, we had induction cookers which we would plug in. Uh, and then we had a microwave. So all in all, it was a very comfortable kitchen and the crew did really well to try and cook some nice meals. Going from just cooking for yourself to a six-person crew, sometimes your proportions are not right. And on top of that, we're all trying to learn to cook with dehydrated food and freeze-dried meat. So a lot, at first, we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, but, but the crew did a really good job of trying to make the dehydrated food taste good, because it's kind of hard to give dehydrated food a taste. This is what our pantry looked like. Everything was shelf-stable, dehydrated, and freeze-dried. When we first got there, we had all of our supplies with us, and we had to divide up our food for the four months. So we had to go through and inventory everything and you know, kind of predict which months we should put food in. There's supposedly a mid-mission slump that crew members often get, no matter what mission you're on, even if it's just for two weeks. Um, psychologists have said there's a mid-mission slump. So if we had some chocolate bars, we would put those you know, in month two and three. Uh, so. This was to the right of our kitchen. You can see our one window there. Um, we also had a projector on the right, which we used to play video of uh, movies at night if someone had movies on their hard drives. We also ate here, and we had meetings here. This was a very multi-purpose area. Um, we had some really pretty sunsets. It was one of the only things that changed for us throughout the day, so having a window psychologically was very nice. Um, this was the sunset on the 4th of July from our window, and I really like it because it's red, white, and blue. I thought that was kind of cool. This is what it would typically look like when we ate food. Um, someone made bread that day, which is exciting because that means we had some texture to our food. And actually, this was Tiffany's birthday, so she made a cake for herself. She made a cake for herself on her birthday because she wouldn't tell any of us when her birthday was, so that's why she had to make the cake. That was, a, that was a fun day. Um, when you're living inside in isolation and you're kind of disconnected, you have to find every little way to celebrate uh, things that are going on. So when there was something to celebrate about, we definitely tried to celebrate it. This was to the right of 
what you just saw. And again, it, because it's a geodesic dome and there's a very high volume, it did feel very big inside. I don't know if this is what a real habitat would look like. Um, but you can see we have our radios for when we go out on EVA. We had a inflatable couch that was kind of deflating the whole mission. And then this is where we kept two of our suits because they didn't all fit in our airlock. And then we had a treadmill. And there was a bike, but the bicycle only worked for about a month, so that was a little frustrating. And this treadmill worked for about three quarters of the mission. So when you can't go outside and you're you know, in this one place the whole time and you know, your, your exercise equipment is failing, it can become a little frustrating. That's the only way you can really increase your steps and get a lot of activity. And on a Mars mission, because of the microgravity, uh, crew members are going to have to work out between two and three hours every day. So when you're trying to simulate this with limited equipment, it becomes very challenging. So the three female crew members, we couldn't get the guys to catch on, but we all did the insanity workout, if anyone's familiar with Sean T. Um, so <laughs> that kept us going. Uh, this is the view to the stairs that go upstairs. Um, so we had the six crew quarters upstairs and one toilet. And Tiffany is up there because she's hanging the blue marble flag that um, we got during, we had a mid-mission resupply, and that was one of our fun gifts that we got was the world flag, because when we do go to Mars one day, it's going to have to be a worldwide effort. It can't just be NASA, it can't just be North America, USA, it has to be the world. Um, this was our laboratory. This is where my crew member Lucy was growing her plants with the LED lights. And this is what it looked like with the, the flaps up. And you can imagine after eating dehydrated food, when Lucy said it was her day to harvest food, we were so excited because we would get to eat lettuce. Um, she harvested about four times throughout the mission, so uh, yeah, it was very rare and we were very excited when it happened. This was an orbitech chamber. If you're familiar with NASA, you'd be familiar with Veggie that just went up on the space station where astronauts could grow vegetables in space for the very first time. However, they had to freeze dry their vegetables and send them back to Earth. They couldn't eat them. So on our mission, we were really happy that we could actually eat the, the food. Uh, so this Orbitech chamber, uh, the crew was actually taking care of the plants inside. And she was growing things like tomatoes and snap peas. And one day I harvested snap peas, and it was you know, exciting because it had been weeks and weeks. And this was our harvest. So we had to split these up in between six people. So again, when we got to eat vegetables, it was like you ate them as slow as possible because it was a very rare occurrence. But um, Growing, growing vegetables in space is going to be a big challenge. This is something that's very necessary, um, but there's, there's a lot of challenges because when you're in microgravity, fluids don't behave the same. You don't have the convection term. Surface tension takes over. So everything that you think you're learning in fluids on Earth uh, is very different in microgravity. This was our first floor bathroom. We had one shower, so this was the only shower that we had. And we had eight minutes of water per crew member per week. So if you're talking about we're working out two and a half hours a day, you can take eight minutes for your, for your whole week. Um, this is what our toilets looked like. They were waterless composting toilets. And the way that they work is the waste goes inside this orange drum, and there's some waste-eating microbes in it. And you have to keep them at a certain temperature or else they'll die. And you also have some soil in there, some, some buffer. And so the idea is you rotate this drum every few days to mix the waste. And then there's an evaporation chamber at the bottom. And then the liquid waste gets evaporated and goes upside out of our vent, which I showed you in that first picture with the, the vent that's coming out. And so then, uh, after a couple of weeks, you back rotate the drum. And the waste drops from that square into this green bucket. And in this bucket are some more microbes and some more filler. And after a few more weeks, um, you're able to use it as soil and plant things in it, you know, and eat from your garden. However, <laughs> our first floor uh, toilet failed. It was terrible. Um, well, we, so when we, first, when we first got in there, we said, okay, the three guys will use upstairs and the three girls will use downstairs. Naive as, you know, looking back, that was probably not a good idea because we should have mixed them because there's a proportion, girls use more toilet paper than guys, right? So not only that, but our first floor bathroom um, got extremely cold at night. Sometimes it was 40 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and it, the heater inside the toilet couldn't keep up the temperature between 70 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit to keep the microbes alive. So we think what happened was our microbes died 
and then the waste wasn't de decaying. And so, after two months, we were like, hmm, our toilet's full. You know, what do we do? We, can't, we don't really have many options. So, um, you know, you gotta do, you gotta do. <laughs> so, who's to deny? This, this picture's funny because it shows we're probably, you know, not ready to go to Mars, according to this picture. But, um, we, we had to put our garbage bags in plastic and go in and remove all the waste and put it into tubs that were then carried down the side of Mauna Loa and someone, some poor soul had to take them and do whatever they had to do with them. But, um, so this picture's funny because you can't tell, I'm not smiling because I've already been in the bathroom and started the process and came back out and said, I need nose plugs and a face, a mask on my face. Lucy hasn't gone in yet, so she's all smile still. <laughs> but you have to keep a good, a good personality about it because, you know, you, you can't open the windows, you can't open the doors. What are you going to do? You just have to get it done. So stuff like that happened and made you a closer, uh, closer team. Um, this was the shipping container that was connected to um, the dome. And in here we did some dirty work. It was like a lab area. And then this was also our food storage boxes from the food that you saw dumped out everywhere. And then in this wood container was our um, water pump. And then we had two uh, lithium ion solar batteries that were storing all of our solar power. And then we had a conversion system where if we went into backup power, um, it would all happen here. This was one of the dashboards we had. We had sensors all over the habitat that would tell us about our utility collection. Um, so this is sort of a layout of the habitat and we could see uh, temperature, CO2 levels. And then on the left you see battery A and battery B, how much charge we're at, um, how much power we're generating and consuming, and then fun things like solar flux, weather, um, rainfall. And so you have to keep an eye on all the systems all the time because you have to be conservative with power, you have to be conservative with water. You're not just, you know, you can't just be sad to say, but wasteful like we are in everyday life and we don't realize, you know, how lucky we are to have running water whenever we want or um, worrying about the CO2 levels when you're working out in a combined space. So these are things that all have to be monitored. Um, this was our airlock. So before and after we would go outside, we would have a mock compression and decompression like you would, you know, on a real mission. And these were our hazmat suits that we wore. These were one type of um, simulated spacesuit, if you will. Um, okay, and then to get ready for an EVA, it actually took us quite a long time, especially if you were getting into the white suits that I'll talk a little bit about. So when I play this video, just try and focus on this part. The first part, the video cuts off, but it's me trying to get into the suit, and you're gonna see it, it really is like a three-person effort. So you have to make sure that you are you have ice in your water pack because you wear a liquid cooling garment because it gets so hot. Then you have a battery that's running your fan, so you have to check all the connections and make sure you know that everything is connected electrically. And then you get in the legs first, and then the crew helps you lift this thing on because it's about 50 pounds on your body. And then the zippers are conveniently located at your butt, so someone has to zipper your butt for you. And then you have to make sure all of your tubes are lined up. And then you put on your radio gear, and then you put on your helmet. And then you go inside for, um, for your airlock compression. So these two white suits are what are called our MXC suits. They were developed by the University of Maryland. They have a big um, tank of water, just like they do at Johnson Space Center in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Um, these suits weighed about 50 pounds when you had them on. Again, you had to wear a liquid cooling garment because they were extremely hot when you wore them. They filled the arms and legs with cotton, I think, just to simulate you know, pressurization in your suit. And then you had batteries that were bringing air in and recirculating um, air into your, your helmet and then your extremities. They had some, some vent lines. And this was a geo tool that we were testing. It's from KSC Swamp Works. They redesigned it from an old Apollo design that took some data um, from, from soil when they were on the moon. So here we were just kind of testing a new design for ergonomic reasons. However, today you would probably use a lot of robotics to get different soil characteristics. So again, we were assigned different um, EVAs from mission control. Sometimes they were for science. Sometimes they were just to see how a crew would perform under pressure um, because you know you had to do a lot of hiking and when you're in this heavy suit you, know, you get very hot your communication can get bad from your radios 
We're going to do different things like characterize the cinder cones around us, the volume, how deep were the, the pit craters, all different kinds of things. Um, but every time we went out, we were happy because we were in the sun. Uh, we were out of you know, our little bubble of isolation, and you could walk around a lot more than you could inside. So a lot of us loved EVAs. We did EVAs about every other day. Um, uh, we also had to do EVAs to check our systems. So even though we had sensors on the dashboard I had just showed you showing our, our water level in our tanks, we still had to go out and manually check because we didn't trust them. So uh, we had to take a ladder out and go climb and you know, measure the height and make sure that the, uh, the transducer was reading the right level. Uh, then we were assigned a very interesting EVA one day. Um, we had to go, we were told a solar flare has occurred and it's going to hit Mars, you know, in X amount of time. You need to go out and find different lava tubes to go and hide for a few days. And so um, there's a lot of people that think that NASA should, or whoever goes to Mars should go and live in lava tubes because they can shield you from radiation. They're very protective to the elements on Mars and they can be very spacious for a habitat. So anyway, they said, go find a good lava tube to live in um, and then go in and place items in there as if you were going to stay there and hide out until this solar uh, incident goes away. So I had never really, maybe some of you have been to Hawaii or know what I'm talking about and have hiked lava tubes yourself as, as day hikers, I don't know. But I had never been to them before and this is what I saw for my very first one. And, uh, and you can see my crew member for size. This is one end of the channel and this is the other end. And what happens is this lava is erupting out of a volcano Sometimes the tubes, the outer layer hardens and cools off before the inside cools. And so once all the, the, the lava drains, you get these big tunnels. And so this was, you know, one end of the tunnel and the other end. And then this whole entire area had collapsed. And this, it's called a skylight, and it just collapsed so you can actually see the channels. And so this picture doesn't do justice, but you would probably have to repel, you know, down there. And I was like, well, you've got to be kidding me. How are we going to get down there with these suits? So anyway, we were able to find some openings of skylights in the lava tubes that um, you could enter. So we found one that we finally thought would work. And we had to prove that we could find a platform that was sturdy enough um, that would be able to house our crew for a temporary amount of time. And this is what the other side of that picture looked like. And this whole ground over here, it's hard to see, but it's completely unstable. But there was a nice bridge over here. And you can actually see that an animal um, had died there. And that's, its bones are left over. But um, anyway, so we dropped off all of our supplies, thinking like, are you really going to make us sleep in these overnight? You know, Our fan packs are only on AA batteries, some of them. So we didn't, we didn't know how we were going to really stay in simulation. But Anyway, we brought everything, and I look really happy in this picture. I'm on the right. I look really happy. However, this was probably my worst EVA. It was one of my last EVAs because um, you have two vent fans in this suit. You have one near your head and one near your back so that there can be some circulation of your air. And um, as we were climbing down into the lava tube, which looks like this, which is essentially a rock slide, and everything's kind of unstable, I guess my back fan had disconnected, and, or it stopped working, and I didn't realize that it had stopped working. I just thought I was struggling to breathe because, you know, it was a lot of work in this plastic bag that you have over your head, you know, and you're trying to rock climb. So anyway, I'm like having some trouble, I'm out of breath, and, you know, we bring everything, I smile for the picture, and then we, we climb back up, and, you know, you're back in the sun, and I'm just really hot, and I'm like, oh man, like, this is really bad. I've had so many good EVAs, this one's like terrible. And so we're, I'm like at telling my crew, like, I just need a minute to like breathe, and they're like, okay. So we're kind of just standing there, and I'm just like breathing, and then I start like hyperventilating, and I'm starting to sweat, and I'm like, this is crazy. And um, so then we, I'm like, okay, I'm good, guys, I'm good. Back to that whole, like, you don't ever say what's wrong. Well, I was being hard-headed at the moment. And so we kept hiking, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to pass out. So I, was, I told Tiffany, I was like, Tiffany, I'm going to pass out. I think I'm going to pass out. And she's, like, and she's like, Annie, this is a simulation. Just crack your suit open. And I was like, <laughs> and I, mean, I didn't want to. Because I knew if I did that, you know, it would be breaking simulation. But then I was like, okay, well, this isn't worth showing up in the news saying, you know, NASA employees on um, simulation passed out. So, but I, I was mad because, you know, on a real mission, if something happened to uh, 
an astronaut, you know, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be all they have. They, they're not going to be able to open their suit because the atmosphere on Mars is 96% carbon dioxide, and you can't really breathe that uh, to sustain yourself. So anyway, cracked my suit open, and I went back. I felt like a big failure. I was like, oh man, you know, I broke simulation, but it's okay. I'm back, and you know, it's definitely not worth um, passing out over. So we also had some fun UVAs. This was on the 4th of July. The three U.S. crew members went on top of the Cinder Cone Hill with our flag. And then the French have Bastille Day, and the Canadians have Canada Day. So uh, as much as we like to think this is unique, uh, there are three other, three other countries that day. But we did have some fun UVAs like that. Um, then this is this <laughs> happened on May the 4th. You know, you have to entertain yourself sometimes. Um, this was this is how many of our nights were. Except they, this is when we were taking all of our surveys for the very first time at night, and we wanted to make sure we were doing it right, so we were all together. But then after that, we sat in our rooms before bed and filled out a lot of surveys and uh, things like that. Uh, and then we also all had research, so I had the opportunity to have a company let me borrow a portable FTIR so that um, I could analyze the the gases in the plant chambers, as well as where I was storing the garbage, excuse me, which was in those two bins, um, to see what kind of volatile organic compounds were being generated from our waste or in the habitat in general. Um, and then, since I was also worrying about, you know, the waste generation profile, how crew interacted with waste, um, my crew members and I did what they do in the ISS, and they hand compact all their waste into footballs, uh, which are these little um, boxes that you see here, and then we wrap them in duct tape. And then the idea is we take these footballs and we put them inside of our reactor that we have. And so this is challenging for our reactor because you have a lot of different compositions of waste in one reactor, and so your products are going to vary depending on what your inputs are in. And this was my clone for the summer. This was John Miles. He was our intern, and he did everything in the lab. Um, you know, he's putting a football in the reactor, and then this is, this is what we have in our hood there. So he did a really good job. I'm not going to discuss the results here. If you're interested in that, we can talk more later. We wrote a few papers on it. Um, but yeah, so this was what I was studying. And unfortunately, we couldn't bring this reactor over to the habitat with us. Um, so my, my, my favorite moment was going out on the very first night, EBA. My crew member, Ross, took this picture. But I grew up near New York City. And I didn't really get to see the stars at night. And then when I moved down to Florida, you know, about five years ago now, you could see a lot more stars here than New York City. But when you're in Hawaii and the slopes of Mount Lowe, which is a really tall mountain, and you're surrounded by nothing, I mean, this sky out there is incredible. And uh, you can see the Milky Way. And so when I went out there for the very first night EVA, I was in that big white suit. So we had a big, clear plexiglass um, mask. And I was, you know, stomping around on this lava that you don't know if it's going to break under your feet. And you have this loud vent fan in your ears, so you can't really hear anything if everyone is quiet. And I was just walking around. I actually walked, this was our airlock exit, and I walked away from the crew, and away from this light, like, farther, so I could be, like, alone. And I was just looking up at the sky, and I was like, wow, this is incredible. I wonder what, you know, the first humans on Mars are going to feel like. And I'm sure, you know, the astronauts on the moon felt the same way, but that was a really really cool feeling and it was that was probably my favorite favorite moment of the mission. And then this is uh, two hazmat suits and one of the white suits in the middle again at night. Uh, there are a few meteor showers that we tried to catch while we were out there. So that's a picture from one of those nights. And then this was us, the very few moments that we came outside of the habitat. Ron came to greet all of us and so we're all happy and excited to be you know, back outside and to feel the elements on your face for the first time was really cool. And actually the colors of the area that were around us changed because we only saw the area, you know, behind a piece of plastic the whole time. So to come outside and to see everything, it looks so different at first. But then your eyes adjust and you, you kind of get over it. But, um, so that, that was the crew. Um, here's some things you might be thinking. What was a typical day like? I would wake up usually first, or someone else did, and I, we woke up pretty early, and I would do some workouts in a shipping container, eat my breakfast, because we got to eat breakfast on our own, and then I would do my, my trash project stuff and get that done with, and then it was around lunchtime where we would all come together for our first meal, um, and then in the afternoon if we had an EVA that we had to do, we would do that, or if we had other mission tasks that needed to be worked on, we did those, but then we also did 
um, more exercise in the afternoon. And we would come together again to eat dinner. And after dinner, we had more surveys. So let me back up, we had surveys at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, so surveys were a big part of our day, but it became a routine thing for us, so we didn't really you know, notice that too much after a while. And then at night, um, we, you could either read in your room, play a game with the crew, depending on how much power we had and how many lights we could keep on, uh, or sometimes watch a movie on the projector. Um, would I do this again? So I say this because, you know, what is this? Would I do this analog machine again? Probably not, unless I could bring some sort of technology to help boost its technology readiness level. Um, would I apply to go to Mars? I think if the technology was ready and there was something beneficial that I could give to it, I would apply. Um, what did I miss the most? I missed my two dogs. I'm a dog person, so it's one thing to tell your family and your friends why you're going and why you think it's beneficial, but then you can't really tell your dogs, like, yeah, see you in four months. Um, and if anyone has a dog, you kind of know that feeling when you're away for a long time and then you go see them. So I missed my dogs. Um, what was the hardest thing? Probably the toilet, because after we fixed the toilet, we knew it was going to fail again because we didn't have the proper heating, you know, to make sure the microbes didn't die again. But then, like two weeks before the mission ended, I hear Lucy scream, and I'm like, oh no, you know, what happened? So I run downstairs, and she's like, we ha there's rodents! And I was like, what? So I'm like, okay, if it's a rat, we can handle a rat, that's fine. And then I went in, she was in the bathroom, and I was like, oh no, <laughs> no, not the toilet again. So I go in, and she's like, look! Look at the toilet! And I was like, what? You know, I don't see anything. And she's like, look closer. And so I'm like, staring at the toilet. She's like, look at the dust. The dust is moving. And I was like, oh no. So we had an outbreak of mites in our toilet, which was crazy because we didn't have any like repellent or something to treat bugs. So I was running around the house trying to find something that could treat these bugs. And we found vinegar. And I know vinegar kills ants. So anyway, we just tried wiping these mites off and they just somehow kept reproducing and it was like, oh my gosh. So anyway, that, it wasn't the hardest thing, but it was probably the most annoying thing because it's your only toilet and, you know, it's like, you're gonna have to go to the bathroom, so stuff you have to deal with. What was the easiest for me? Uh, it was probably the isolation, actually. I, I kind of enjoyed it a little bit, which I don't know if that's a weird thing or not, but it was nice to be able to you know, have some rights before bed where you can read a book or, you know, just kind of be quiet for a while. So, so that, that wasn't too bad for me. What was my most favorite? I already told you guys the night EVA was my most favorite moment. Did we all get along? Uh, yes, we all got along. But it's like any other thing. You know, you have your family. Sometimes you guys have conflict. Um, and unfortunately for us, you can't just, like, go take a walk. You'll be back in an hour to cool off. No, you have to deal with your conflict then in the air. Um, you know, and, and figure out how you can be on a good level again because you have nowhere to go You're in isolation. So we all got along. Nobody, nobody wanted to kill anybody. So we have we have a long way to go before we we do go to Mars. But um, this mission will be, will be very beneficial for the psychology that it can bring. And if all the crew members can bring individual research, they can boost the technology readiness level here on the ground. So that maybe they can go get it sent up to the ISS and progress their technology even more. So that is my story, and if you have any questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them. So, thanks. Did you say that what you were doing there, someone was doing the same thing someplace else? Yes, so all the data I was gathering on how much trash the crew was producing and of what material, um, at Kennedy, they were actually putting that simulant in our reactor and processing it to see how much um, output and products we were getting. Because we couldn't bring the reactor inside the habitat with us. I put that slide at the end to avoid all those questions. <laughs> I had a feeling you would ask them. Sure. Was the uh, habitat hermetically sealed or was it more just the uh, isolation potential? Uh, it wasn't hermetically sealed. We had um, an air intake from outside, similar to that of your house. So we had an air handle and then the vent at the top. I'm sorry. Uh, on the display readout, it said the 
the top of the dome was getting up to 184 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, we had one bad sensor, and that wasn't oh. one of the burners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that wasn't 184 degrees. Uh -huh. <laughs> gonna... You said you had to exercise twice, at least every day. Uh, for two and a half hours every day. And that's because when you're in microgravity, um, you know, you, you don't have the weight of gravity working against you with resistance, so you would have to do a lot more exercise to keep your, mu your muscle and your, your bone density from degrading. And so there's a whole exercise science that goes on on just the human body. So we were just simulating that an astronaut would have to work out between two and three hours a day in the microgravity of Mars. So you did like about an hour at breakfast time, an hour at lunch, Hour at dinner? Kind of, yeah. Three times a day? Yeah. Good. Uh, what kind of things were you doing as an undergraduate student to prepare for the career you have now? Okay, what kind of things was it? Um, well, when I was an undergraduate, I wasn't working for NASA yet, and I had no idea I was going to be doing something like this. So I guess, you know, just do what you're passionate about and work really hard at it. And um, if you enjoy what you're doing, and you're passionate about it, I mean, it, it won't feel like work as much. So just, I guess, just keep charging and doing what you like, because if you hate what you're doing, I mean, you have to work. In uh, America, you know, you're probably gonna have to have a job and you're gonna have to work to get money, so do something that you're passionate about. Whether it's this or, you know, you could see people often think NASA. NASA doesn't need psychologists or people in the arts. NASA just needs engineers. That's not true at all. NASA needs the full, full spectrum. I don't know if that answers Let's just question. take a couple more questions. Can you stay afterwards? Here? Yeah, okay, absolutely. So let's a couple more public and then we'll close it up and you can talk to her. Were you able to make recommendations to following crews for things that they could do better? And, and as an example, when your suit failed, I would think that on Mars you'd like to have a buddy sharing system where you could hook suits together and share resources. Yeah, so our crew, that's a really good question. Our crew actually made um, a whole like habitat manual and like if something goes wrong, here's what we recommend that you do. We also told mission support you should buy you know, these types of spares for the suits or these types of parts for the future missions. So yeah, hopefully it goes a little smoother. We were kind of like the guinea pig crew. Um, but also, just so you guys know, after this is done, uh, the recruiting office gave me a whole bunch of stuff up here. So uh, please feel free to come up and take it, and I'll explain what it is you know, if you choose to come up. All right. So let's uh, please join me in thanking uh, Annie for her great. You come up and get your stuff if you want to sign. <laughs>